the only six ways to get clients. I mean, there's not like 150 different ways. Everything that you can think of, and we're going to unpack the 10 most popular ways in which you can get clients as we end 2023, get into 2024, the audience can get a great list of a bunch of lead generation ideas on how to go out there and generate real estate leads, how to go out there and get real estate clients. But really, there's only six ways, okay? Number one is what we call unpaid inbound. Number two is unpaid outbound. Number three is paid inbound. Number four is paid outbound. Number five is your past clients' centers of influence. And then number six is referrals. I mean, that's it. That's the only way you can get clients. Now, of all the different lead generation uh, strategies or ideas, they all fall with inside one of those six, those six categories. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to rank the 10 most popular ways to generate leads. And then we're going to break down the pros and cons of each. And we're going to start with what, uh, at least what I believe to be the least effective way to the most effective way. So the way in which I'm ranking this, you guys, is is based on two factors, time and money. I mean, it's really the only two resources we have in life, yeah? So we either have a lot of time and very, very little money, or we have a lot of uh, money uh, and very, very little time, right? That's kind of the equation. That's how I'm basing these off of. So let's get into it. Number 10, let's start off with a paid inbound approach. So the tactic here would be things like radio, or I wrote down uh, billboards, TV commercials, you know, big direct mail farming campaigns. So the idea with a paid inbound approach is you're going to pay money over a long period of time to get the consumer to initiate contact with you. So it's paid and it's getting the phone to ring. Now, the reason why I have this as 10, as the least effective, it isn't that any of these work or don't work. They all work. The reason why I have it ranked at 10, this is my thoughts and I'll get your guys' in a second, is this is really expensive. This type of business is has the lowest profit margin, number one, and the longest conversion cycle, number two. So for me, those are like two major red flags as to why I think there's so many other ways to go out there and generate leads besides doing this. When you look at all the ways to generate leads, you've got this at the top for me. It's like the most expensive and it takes the longest. Probably the two worst things for real estate agents. Ben, your thoughts on that? Just look at every market has somebody doing this at a, at a big, big level, right? And I would say nationwide, typically it's like attorneys, right? Like that are super busy. They've got a lot of time and, and typically it's like an injury type of attorney or something. There's obviously other industries doing this at a big, big scale. But I, I just think of it as somebody that succeeded at a high, high level and they're just looking to outsource it completely. It's hard to track, it, but they don't even care. They're so busy and the phone just keeps ringing. Yeah, I would agree. Dominic, I wanna to come to you and get your thoughts on this pay, on paid inbound, but I agree. This, this tactic typically comes into play when uh, somebody has excess, a, a lot of excess capital. Right. They, they've, the business is thriving because this is like mass branding. Right, this is mass media, mass advertising. Yeah, that guerrilla marketing. And another so, way to look at this list too is like a checklist, right? And that's number ten because it'd be the last thing you'd probably do. That's exactly exactly right. Dom, your thoughts on paid inbound? Yeah, so I actually had written down which what chapter are you in, and it's pretty much exactly what Ben described. I think about. Uh, some of the agents in my market that are utilizing some or all of these strategies. And yeah, they are at the point where they already have tremendous success. And this is just like doubling. This is like keeping the full court press going when you've already won by 100 points. I, they, they probably don't need this to keep going, but they're farming 5,000 houses. They have radio advertising going. It's constant name recognition. But if you're in chapter one of your real estate career, 
as as a, many many agents are because of the turnover um investing fifty thousand dollars a year or a hundred thousand dollars a year in in number 10 is not the strategy to start with that's right you you typically see uh your your top top teams top top producer do this late in their career you know 10 15 20 years in the game uh they're already making you know they're very very successful already and this is just money that they can burn. Literally, they can put it into a trash can and burn it. It's a so tax they just want, write off. Like it's a the tax people write I off. know that did it, they did it for tax reasons first, and then they're like, wow, this is actually working really well. Yeah, yeah. So, all right, let's go on to number nine. Number nine is what we call forced registration leads. So here's what these are. I think if people aren't familiar with this, the idea here is to uh, partner with a company like a Commissions Inc., like a Boomtown. Um, and what happens is this. You give your credit card to one of these companies. They go out there and they target specific keywords on either Google or Facebook. They're trying to drive traffic through advertising, right? You're paying them money to get the consumer to go to your website, like on one of these platforms. And these platforms require the consumer to give their information in order to view properties in a general area. So one of the most, um, one of the ways they do this is they'll say, you know, homes under 500,000 with pools in Wilmington, North Carolina, right? And so that's the offer. I don't even know if there's a Wilmington, North Carolina. I just made that up. Uh, that's the offer they put, you know, the budget, 500 or $800 a month, whatever the agent's spending with this company, into that uh, search uh, phrase or that, that keyword. And then they force people to opt in. Now, the problem with this is, yeah, you could probably get leads for like 10, 12 bucks, $14 a piece, which is fairly reasonable. The companies can perform. Like it's easy for these companies to deliver on those leads. So the agent, kind of gets a little um, false sense of security. Like they give company X their credit card and they see these leads start popping in to their CRM, right? Like, man, this is awesome. This is really working. Well, until they find out, they start to understand that A, these people are not calling the agent. You see, most of the time when agents go to invest money, it's because they're looking to avoid the pain of having to initiate conversation. When it comes to lead generation, as both of you are, are, are well aware, agents are looking to avoid that. They're looking for the path of least resistance. So they give a credit card to a company. The company says, here's your lead. They still have to do what? They got to pick up the phone and do the thing that they were hoping to avoid, which is to initiate the conversation. So company X got you Bob Smith at 123 Main Street with a phone number for 10 bucks. And now you have to call Bob. When you call Bob, you're met with a ton of rejection. I didn't fill that out. No, no, I'm not interested. Listen, listen, take me off your list. And it's like, wait a minute. Like, what's going on with these leads? These leads convert on an average of 1%. And they take an average, an average of 14 months to convert. These are the averages. And so for me, it's like, okay, wow. I got to spend a lot of money. So if the conversion rate is, is a, is a 1% conversion. Yeah. And your average commission is, or, or your average sales price is 300,000. I was going to try to do the math. It might cost you three, $4,000 to close one deal where you're making eight, 10, 12 grand. So profit margins on these are a little bit better than paid inbound. However, I don't know about you, but most of the agents that I talk to don't can't wait a year to get paid and have to pay the entire time. That's why you see a lot of teams. This is like uh, big for teams so that they can fill their agents with leads because they're selling leads when they're recruiting. And this is an easy way for that team leader just to put their credit card on file, set them up with a Commissions Inc. website, and they just get like their 20, 30 leads a month, and they're fulfilling on that promise of giving leads. Dominic, let me go to you first on this way of, of generating business. Well, I was smiling because I've done this and I've done the one before too and spent a lot of money and spent a lot of time chasing people that say exactly what you were saying. Well, I didn't sign. I, no, I just wanted to look at that one property, dude. I just signed up for that one property. I'm not looking for a house. 
it's just you're finding people that are in a, at a different part of the funnel, right? These people are way, 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 way at the top of the funnel. You're when I say funnel, I mean we we know what we're talking about. That that's uh, yeah. industry speak, but people that are just dipping their toes in the water, exploring. But when you're paying for those leads, you're paying top dollar for somebody who has just started the process. And again, look, if you're in that chapter of your life, as you pointed out, where you have a team that is doing a lot of production, has tons of automation and can manage a lot of these people, then this can work. But for most agents in this business, again, this is not a this is not a strategy that I think that I would recommend to somebody who's in the business, you know, less less than a year, certainly, but probably less than a few years. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it just comes down to expectation. And I think that's the challenge, right? It's like, because it's the easiest thing to sell. Like if I'm selling on the behalf of Real Geeks or Boomtown, it's so easy to sell this. It's like, hey, yeah, how, how much can you afford to, to market? Well, 500 bucks a month. Okay, cool. So 500 bucks a month, watch how this works. Divided by 12, we can get you about 40 leads a month. Now, this, to the agent, they don't have context of what a lead is, what a lead is not. But the, but the company is fulfilling on that. So um, it's not until it's like an aftermath does the agent find out, holy crap, man, this isn't, this is hard. This is real hard. I can't just give my credit card. And they think a lead is someone who wants to go look at a house today. It ain't that way. Ben, your thoughts on this? The people that we see succeeding with this are the, the bigger teams because they have the infrastructure to follow up with those leads for 14 months at like relentlessly, right? Um, or hold somebody on their team accountable to do that. And that's, you know, even at that point, the conversion still one, two, 3%. Yeah. I mean, we had, I had uh, a friend of mine, Spring Benson on the podcast. I mean, that's who I'm thinking about, right? She probably does this at the highest level in the country, converting of internet leads. And I mean, her average was 18 months, right? And you know, they can do it when you got 40, 50 agents on your team, you've got ISAs, you've got systems, you've got visibility, you've got processes, you've got tons of accountability. Um, once you get it going that year, year and a half, it can work, but it's still, it's a very, very difficult thing for the solo agent who's just getting started for it to, to make sense. All right, let's move on to number eight. So number eight is networking. So the idea is you know, I'm a local agent to my local market. I'm going to go, there's all these networking groups and these BNIs and these uh, chamber of commerce and all that stuff, which can be, can work, can work. But I want to talk about another, the, the downside of this, and it does have some upside too. The downside of this is when you first get started, right? This is all about expectation. Everything takes a long time, by the way. So I'll preface it with that. The challenge with networking for most real estate agents when they uh join one if you've been in this business for like longer than five minutes you already know that most people already know a real estate agent now you get into a networking event or a networking group where these are professionals that are looking to do business with one another chances are if you're the new guy on the block and those people have been in the networking group for 10 12 years they all got deep, 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 deep relationships with a real estate agent, most likely. And it's going to take years for you to build these relationships before it starts to uh, generate opportunities for you. And the problem with networking is this. I don't hate it. It's just that people do it wrong, you guys. What, what I mean by that is they go into it looking to see what can I get out of it. They go into it with their hands out. I'm looking to get referrals. Ben, can you give me a referral? Dominic, give me, give me, give me, give me. And we know networking is all about the giver's game. It is all about the law of reciprocity. So if you go into a networking group with the mindset of what can I get from this, you will get very, very little. Dominic, have you been part of these uh, over your career? So when you put networking down, I, yeah, no, no, the answer is no. I don't do the networking groups. I do make a point of networking with agents who are in areas that I, or agents and lenders, actually, when I come across an agent who's developing farmland, for example, I ask him, hey, man, you know what, what holes are there in your business that you need to fill? Same with a lender. If I have a great experience with a lender, hey, man, listen, this was an above average experience. 
I'm I'm curious, you know, what is it that you look for in a great real estate agent to partner with? And I've asked that question to lots of lenders and I've come out of it with just a couple of really quality relationships where they end up, it, it ends up being reciprocal, right? But otherwise, uh, yeah, I haven't had a lot of widespread success with that strategy. Yeah. And, and it's, it's tough to make them work, you know? Uh, I don't know. What about you, Ben? Have you ever been part of your local BNI or your local chamber of commerce and try to go in there and meet with the insurance agent and meet with this guy and that guy? Yeah, absolutely. And it, it was something that, you know, when I started 2011, it's like super, that, that was a big focus in a small town. It's like, that's just what you do. Right. Um, and I just, through my experience, found that the forced networking groups versus, which we'll get to later on in this conversation, more of an, a natural approach, yeah. it just, just doesn't work, right? Um, everybody wants, right? And, and like Dominic said, and you said, it's all about adding value and it's a long-term play. Um, so can they work? Absolutely. I, I didn't have a great experience with it, had a lot more success with, with other things. The other thing that I just hate it getting into this business was having to be the guy if this was the sole way i was going to build my business of like everybody i talked to hey i'm a realtor hey i'm a realtor hey 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 i'm your guy hey come on come on come on come on let me let me get let me sell your house let me sell your sister's house and your brother's house and i just didn't want to do that um and that's why i gravitated towards other lead sources yeah, that's a really good point. You know, it's uh, I think about that, and I've been part of a lot of these BNI groups and LBNs, and all. There's just tons of them, right? And you're right. Some of those people in there are just like so annoying. You know, it's like, yeah. oh my gosh, I, I wish I didn't meet Got this my person. Name tag on. Yeah, the name tag. It's like, okay, now every single time I I see this person, they're trying to sell me life insurance. It's like, dude, yeah. I, I'm good, man. I'm good. Yeah. I'm good. Or they're I just promise. Pestering you for referrals. Pestering you for referrals. You got someone for me this week. You got someone for me. This week? It's just forced and it doesn't work. We're going to talk about referral partners as a strategy later, which is completely different. Um, we'll get, we'll come back to that. All right, let's go to uh, number seven. Number seven is is a paid outbound uh, approach, which is what I'm referring to here is hiring another person to call your leads on your behalf. So this could be somebody who maybe you're buying some of these forced registration leads. Maybe you're investing in Google PPC and you're getting leads. Maybe you're hiring an ISA to uh, cold call on your behalf. I have this as number seven. This can be extremely successful, but again, it's very difficult and it all comes down to expectations. What we see most often is an agent who says, okay, I'm bought in to the fact that I've got to play offense. I'm bought into the fact that I have to, if I really want to win, I have to be the one to go out there and initiate conversations with people that I know and initiate conversations with the people that I don't know. I, I'm bought into that. But guess what? I just don't want to do it. So I'm just going to try and pay this other human to do the thing that I don't want to do. And that expectation right there is the reason why this tends to not work as well as it can, because what it's designed to do is be leveraged lead generation. In other words, because you're succeeding uh, so much in your prospecting efforts that there's so much, there's only so much time. The only way to get more time is to have leverage with another human being so you can double down on the activity that's already working for you. And so if that is you, it could make sense for you. If you're succeeding at a high level, converting internet leads, converting uh, outbound cold calls, converting expired listings, converting for sale by owners, well, it would make sense for you to bring another person on and double down and another person on to triple down on that activity. But if you're not succeeding in it yourself, the idea to outsource this to someone else, it's going to be an uphill battle. Ben, I know you got a lot of experience with this. What are your thoughts? I think going into this, you have to really have clear expectations of this is not you building a sales team. Mm. This is you adding a, um, a nurse to your practice. You're still the doctor and they're just going in there. They're getting the vitals and then they're passing it on to you and, and you're still doing the operation, writing the prescription. Um, but 
having a team of nurses can really leverage your time and, and add a lot of value. I think so many people fall into the trap of thinking, okay, now I've got a salesperson. I don't need to do anything except go sign a contract. Great point. And so what I wrote down, and Dominic, I want to get your thoughts on this too, was again, comes back down to what is my expectation? What is my mindset going into this uh, endeavor? And I wrote down lead versus appointment, right? Most of the time, or that's, the, that's the expectation. I can just hire this person. They'll set all my appointments for me. And I just show up on the appointment and get these contracts signed. Ain't, ain't, ain't going to happen. What they're looking to do is to shake the tree. They're looking to go out there and call those top of funnel prospects and find the ones on your behalf that are looking to transact business in the next six to 12 months. They find the person. And then to Ben's point, then they give them to you because you're the doctor, you're the practitioner, it's your business, and you're the one having that conversation, converting that person into an appointment, and then ultimately enrolling them as a client. Dominic, your thoughts on hiring an inside sales agent to make calls on your behalf? Yeah, well, actually, we all three of us have had a lot of conversations about this. And first of all, you better be dang good at it yourself, first of all. Just because you don't want to or you're not good at it is not a valid reason to go and hire somebody else. Because guess what? When you hire that other person, it's your responsibility to train another human to hopefully be good, 70% as good as you are and yep. set that person loose and put them in the world to, to attempt to do what you're doing and then be responsible for that, their success, meaning you have an employee, somebody that you are touching bases with on a daily basis, continuing to update the training for on a daily basis, and they're still not doing exactly what you're doing. They're just, uh, like Ben said, they're, they're just the nurse, right? They are identifying if you have a sick person, if you have somebody who might possibly maybe be open to doing something and keep, and they're just not always going to be as, as good as you. It's a uh, yeah, you better be, all I would say, let me, I'll just say that you better be damn good at prospecting yourself before you even think about hiring another human to do it for you. Great point. The only thing I want to add to that is, is the time expectation with a lot of this stuff. Like the way I think about this for with all these lead generation tactics, every single one, all 10 is it's a 12 month commitment before you even start to judge is this working? Is this not working? You've got to give it like a full on full court press committed for 12 months before you decide, okay, I'm going to do something else. And as we know, that's hard for agents. I mean, they all, I mean, most of us struggle with shiny object syndrome. You know, we do it for 30 days and if it doesn't work, then I'm going to do something different. And if that thing doesn't work in 30 days and I'm off to the next thing, off to the next thing, uh, brings us right to number six, which is direct inbound. Okay, so we're, 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 we're going down saying, okay, this is what we believe to be more and more and more effective. What do I mean by direct inbound? Okay, we, we, we define this at the beginning of the episode, outbound versus inbound. Outbound means agent, you initiate conversation. Inbound means prospect initiates conversation. Everybody, everybody that gets into real estate, I'm gonna broad brush this, I believe, uh, believes that when they become a real estate agent, that it's an inbound business. And why they have that understanding, I don't know, because most of most sales roles out there, I think the idea is inbound. Like if you sell cars or you work at a bank, it's people coming to you, right? And so it's like this false sense of security. That's why those people, for me, they don't even understand how good they have it. If, you, if you're in an industry where you just sit there and people come to you, like when you get into real estate, you really figure out what direct sales means and how hard it is. That's the reason why people struggle with this so badly. So when we say direct inbound, this is an unpaid approach. We're talking about generating content, putting that content in front of a specific targeted avatar and that person responding to the content by reaching out to you. What do I mean? Here's some examples. You could do YouTube videos like we're doing right now. It's how we built our coaching business, right? It's how you can generate real estate clients. You can make content that resonates with your ideal client avatar. And then that person reaches out to you as a result of consuming your content. Another way is blogging. 
You can do the same thing, not video content. You could put it in written format and write articles on your blog. Now, we're not going to get into the whole strategy on how to do it. And people consume the content. And because you've added value to them, naturally, you're starting to attract people to you. Now, I love this strategy. It's probably what I'm most passionate about. But again, context and expectations matters. I've been making a video every day on YouTube since 2017. You know, and it didn't work, so to speak, for like two, three years. It took me doing the activity every day for years for it to quote unquote work, where everybody, again, they want to make one video, write one blog, sit back and say, dude, that didn't work. Well, of course it didn't work. You know, you got to do it for 12 months. We've interviewed multiple different people. We've coached multiple different people that use this strategy in real estate. And everybody would tell you the same thing. They had to do it for about six to 12 months before it started to turn around and start generating clients. So Ben, let me go to you first um, and get your thoughts on direct inbound. Yeah, it, it's, you know, Dom nailed it earlier. It's checklist, right? It's what chapter are you on? Um, you can do this early on and build it alongside some of these other strategies that give you a little quicker results, but it is, Everything is hard. I think it looks sexy from the outside, but everything is hard. But this is just such a cool strategy because although you don't necessarily feel it because you don't experience the rejection, um, that's why it takes longer is because it's just, you're getting rejection, they're just going away, right? The really cool thing is when you do get one of these leads from your content, your blogging, something else that we didn't mention is like your newsletter. Um, strategy is when they come in they're pretty much sold because Great they've point. built they've built a relationship with you one way right they know everything about you they know your strategy your content and you've got like almost like a raving fan at your doorstep and then it's just you outlining you know if it's a good fit or not um so once you get that person it's a cool experience it's a great experience it's a self identity it's a it's a it's a it's the conversion mechanism that where the conversion happens up front because yep. someone's consuming your content they're like oh I like this person I like their personality I like their views oh wow that's really valuable so when I when it's time for me to buy a house I mean this is my girl this yeah, is you my attract guy your tribe you attract your tribe you attract your tribe and you have built in influence because when people consume content there's something magical that happens where like this influence is already built in where they come in and like they really respect your expertise, your advice, your your communication, that your time, they respect it all. Dominic, your thoughts on this? Yeah. Um I I I would ask you, Brandon, you've been doing this for a long time and that's how you and I connected years and years that's and right. years ago was from YouTube, but let me ask you, is your YouTube strategy today the same as it was in 2017. Um, I think the thing that I've learned, the evolution of the strategy is understanding the, uh, the viewer better. My understanding of the viewer versus my understanding of, okay, this is the content I thought I, was, I wanted to make versus this is the content that actually serves people. So the answer to that is no, it's, it's, it's quite different. It's quite different. The way I look at the content though, Dominic, is having a salesperson that works 24 hours a day, seven days a week, who never calls in sick, never complains, never. Because you put a, you put a piece of content out there, it lives on the internet for life, right? So it's constantly, because here's the thing that Google wants. So Google owns YouTube. This is what they want. They want people to consume your content. Why? Because they drive ad revenue, right? So every piece of content you have it isn't like they're trying to kill your content it's quite the opposite they want to find an audience for your content so they're out there working for you around the clock putting your content in front of what they believe to be your avatar that's what they want to do so it's super super powerful uh but yeah my strategy is completely different than it was in 2017. yeah yeah and you you go you go really deep with our students on exactly how, I mean, the consistency is a good part, like is a huge part of it, 
So you know what to do, you know that you have to do it, but but you still need to know exactly how to do it. And I guess where I was going with that is you've developed now over seven years the how exactly the nuts and bolts of how and i think that um that's an important piece that you can't just go willy-nilly making any old random video every single day you have to know what you're doing right yeah great point it has to be strategic that's a thousand percent spot on and yes you need to be consistent just like anything else so let's keep moving let's go to number five so uh i switched this up a little bit i was just kind of thinking through this but for me, number five on the list, I have property specific um, internet leads. So what I mean by property specific is like a Zillow lead, like a realtor.com lead. The difference between this and number nine, the forced registration lead is that Zillow does a great job, realtor.com does a great job of generating an opportunity on a specific property. That's a huge difference than just forcing somebody to opt in to look at house houses in Boise, Idaho. It's like, okay, well, that's a huge difference. This person's inquiring on one, two, three main street. And so it's a buyer that's specifically looking at this property. Now these convert a lot higher, a lot higher than a forced registration lead. Forced registration convert at 1%. These probably convert at like three, four, 5%, somewhere in that range, but they are three, four, five times more expensive. You know, if you're going to get a lead from realtor.com or Zillow right now, you're probably looking at 80, 100, 120, 180 dollars. And even more so than that, most of what Zillow is doing now is on a commission split. So really the way that we look at this now is if you're if your business is coming from Zillow, you're simply a buyer's agent for Zillow the brokerage. You're just on a 35% commission split. So that's the way I think about that is like you just you're an agent for Zillow. So the days of you buying a lead from Zillow, they're getting away from that. And now that's mostly their Zillow flex where you're just an agent for us. We've got a lead for you. And when you close it, you're going to give us 35%. So it's very, very expensive, but they do tend to be better leads than a forced registration. Dominic, your thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah, um, I actually uh, have a friend who does this and has been doing it for several years and she pays 30, 40, 50,000 dollars a month to Zillow and she has very good conversion um, and you know she sells she sells, sells 750, 800,000 dollars a year uh, in G, in GCI but if you just run the math really quickly and you spend 480,000 dollars a year on leads and you sell 750, 800,000, what's your, what's your business model look like? I mean, we're in this business not to get a total number of sales, right? But for net profit and that's right. Not, she's doing very well, but there's a lot of work and a lot of money at capital invested to make that happen. So um, yeah, if you got the money and that's the type of business model that you want, you want to be in business with Zillow and you want to get a text at uh, six o'clock in the afternoon from a buyer that you got to call like in four seconds. If that's the business model that you want, I think it does work very well. Yeah, it does work very well, but you're right. The The downside of it is that what, what Dominic just said, which is like, you are not in control of your business at all. You have to keep feeding the machine and you're always reacting. Birthday party, Christmas Eve, does not matter. If you're gonna convert it, you're spending the money. So you always feel this like that you're always on. Seven days a week, 24 hours a day, especially when you know Zillow does the hot transfer. It's like, if you miss those, then you start to lose rotation. So it's like they force you to live on the phone. It's like, all right, when are they gonna call? When are they gonna call? When are they gonna, all day long. Uh, but they do work, they do work. Ben, your, your, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I still have PTSD from that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like just glued to my phone. I did them at a very, very high level for about 18 months. And it was, I, I viewed it as a, um, as a job. Um, mm. And it was, a, it was a means to an end for a period of time in a stage of life where it made sense. Um, so, I mean, I can do a whole podcast on that in my experience with it, but yeah, it, they absolutely work, but that's kind of my, my two cents on it. Yeah. So let's go to number four. All right. So now we're almost at the top three, but let's go to number four, which I think will surprise some people, uh, but open houses. So I don't know how you guys see it. I actually am a fan. I'm a fan. And, and for the re for this reason, 
we talked about two ways you can uh, buy or you can invest to purchase a buyer opportunity or a seller opportunity. To me, the open house produces a higher quality opportunity for free. And here's why. If you're going to go do an open house, first off, you can, um, it doesn't have to just be your listing. I think that's a huge myth too. You can have, I mean, in my brokerage, our agents are holding open houses for multiple different agents properties, right? So you get to pick and choose, number one, where you work. You get to pick and choose the type of property you'd like to represent. It's phenomenal. With all the other strategies, you don't get to pick any of those two. And then number three, the consumer is coming to you. This is an inbound. They're walking through your storefront based on this property that you're representing. So now you get to pick the clientele that you get to serve as well. And people are walking into the property and you don't have to pay anything for it. And now you get a face-to-face -face conversation with somebody. You didn't have to call them. You didn't have to text them. You didn't have to respond to a lead, right? And then chase them all down. They came to you and you get the best of the best, which is a face-to-face -face interaction uh, right away. So you get direct feedback. And to me, you could do a lot of these. I always tell the story of an agent uh, at, at my uh, at the brokerage that I'm at, and she did four or five open houses a week. You don't uh, the days of just doing the open house on a Saturday afternoons. Like, well, you can do that, but these twilight open houses. You know, I don't know about you guys, but like in our neighborhoods of like Metro Detroit, people are walking the kids and they're walking around with wine. It's like it's like things are happening. Those are the best open houses to me and people are talking, you can build a really good business, a really good database of buyers and sellers through open houses. They're, they, they just require time. It's a time investment. It's a, it's a trade at time for dollars, but I like this because it's so local and you get to pick where you work. And to me, you get to pick the price point. There's so much upside to this. I'm a huge, huge fan. And for agents, I've told this to agents that we coach, if you refuse to pick up the phone, and prospect. You're just not going to do it. Period. End of story. Well, then go all in on open houses. That's like, to me, and I can't wait to get your guys' thoughts. To me, that's a great way to build your business and just do as many as you possibly can. Don, let's go to you. And what are your thoughts on open houses? Yeah, man. <clears throat> I've given this advice so many times to new agents in our group who are just getting going in the business and they're struggling a little bit with the outbound prospecting of this exact advice because it's exactly what I did and it worked for me very very well was the was the mega open house strategy the yep. way you were teaching it I mean we, we used to go door knock though we'd door knock Thursday and Friday before an open house we'd print out 300 flyers and my wife and I would door knock a whole neighborhood I mean it, in July when it was 105 degrees outside and we would bring a barbecue, like a little portable stainless barbecue. And I'd knock on the door and I'd say, hey, look, we're inviting all the neighborhood. Or we're going to have hot dogs, going to have drinks. Come by, check out this house. And man, we'd have 45, 50 people through an open house. We'd have balloons. It was like a circus, a carnival. And we ended up generating five listings from that activity. Not buyers, listings from the neighborhood, like over the course of that year, right? People are like, oh yeah, I remember when you were in our neighborhood five months ago and we didn't do just one open house there. We just kept hammering, hammering, hammering until that house sold. And then the next listing that came up, we did it again and people are to start knowing your name. And it's anyway, amazing. I, I'm pretty excited, excited about that because they work Me for too. Us. I'm yeah. so excited about it too, because man, it's just such a great way to build your business because the neighbor, okay, so here's, here's a fact. A house goes up for sale. Everybody in the neighborhood is wondering what's going on with that property. And the best way to do it is to do exactly what Dominic's saying is, is to bring it to market with a with a, a private open house event for all the neighbors. And all those people are all future sellers. Every single one of them. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. It's a matter of when are they going to sell. And they're looking at you to see how you're representing this property. And they think to themselves, wow, I want an agent like this who do something like that. For my property, I love how you're representing this property. And it's a great way to, to build your business. Ben, your thoughts? It, it's an opportunity to work a completely different uh, time of day, time of week 
where you can run two strategies. Um, that's what I love about it is people that talk about, oh, I need a side hustle or I need, need this. Like this can be your side hustle within your real estate business Great to generate point. just a whole nother slew of, of business. If you're at a certain price point and you want to get into luxury, it's the best way to tap into that. Because like you said, you pick your price point. And if you want your side hustle to be go from selling 750 or 300,000 to a million or 2 million, 3 million, guess what? You, you can do that with this strategy. And, and I just don't think you can do that in any other. Great point. The, the woman I'm talking about, that's exactly what she did. So she mm. started off doing this herself. So she would do it like, that's the greatest thing is if you think about um, the time investment for like prospecting versus this, we'll talk about that in a second. If you just did an open house a day, right? That's your two hours of prospecting, three hours or four hours of work, right? And let people come to you. But here's what she did. She did it all in these high-end properties. And so they weren't her listings. Right. But she represented the property in a way that she attracted high-end clients. Then she took her husband out of General Motors, who was a top-end engineer, and then he started doubling down. So now they're doing two open houses a day in luxury neighborhoods. Then their kids graduated from high school. They had a boy and a girl. They're running four open houses a day. I'm not even kidding. They were the open house kings and queens of our, of our city. Their signs and balloons and huge events all over town every day. Imagine that, 20 open houses a week, right? Wow. 80 a month. I mean, they own the marketplace. And you just see them everywhere. It's like, wow, you guys are the top agents. Anyway, I get excited about it just because it's like probably the easiest strategy ever. Like doesn't require any money, no skill whatsoever. No, like, I don't know why more people aren't doing it. You know, I think I, I know why it's because they do one at a bad property and they get three people. It's like, God, that was a waste of time. I ain't never doing that again. They never it's like, follow well, dude, up with anybody that came. Didn't follow up with anybody, no strategy. And it's like, well, yeah, if you're going to half-ass it, you get you get out what you put in, you know what I mean? So yeah, of course it's not going to work. All right, let's move on. Let's go to number three. Number three is direct outbound prospecting, right? This is what we probably talk about the most. Um, and this means that simply the agent is going to be the one initiating conversations with uh, a specific demographic, right? So there's all kinds of lead sources, okay? You can go after people that are looking to downside. You can go after people that are absentee owners. You can go after expired listings for sell by owners, uh, people that are uh, in default. I mean, the, 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 the list is endless. You can create a specific demographic and you can go reach out to them. And the reason why this is so damn effective is you're 100% in control. It's duplicatable. You can create a system around it where the numbers are absolutely duplicatable. That's why it's so effective. Where everything else, you can't produce the same result. Open houses, it's kind of like a crapshoot, right? This, you are in control. And we've proven this over a long period of time. So we know number of reach outs equals numbers of conversations, which equal number of leads, which equal number of appointments, which equal number of listings, which equal number of closings. It's literally a direct correlation to an activity. That's why it's so effective, yet it's very difficult. It's very hard mentally. It's very hard emotionally. Uh, it requires a, a large level of mental toughness and skill. And, there, and, that, and that is why most people don't succeed in it and they run around saying it doesn't work. It's because they didn't make it work because they didn't stay in there long enough. They didn't have a strong enough mindset and their skill set uh, wasn't at a point where they could make it work. However, we see this strategy being the culprit for most agents that are succeeding quick, making a lot of money, super profitable. Um, and it doesn't matter how old you are, where you're at, how long you've been doing this, anybody can make this work. Dominic, your thoughts first. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, I, I, I built my business this way. So this one is easy for me. But, you know, you said that a lot of agents don't you know, they don't like to do it or they say it doesn't work. Well, because I don't know, show me anything in any business anywhere that's easy, productive and fast. And you make a lot of money doing like those things just don't exist in the same world. Yeah, it's a great point. How about you, Ben? I'm, I'm, I'm right there with you. It's, you know, open houses is a great way <laughs> free to get buyer leads, right? This is a phenomenal way 
to pick your market, to pick your, your lead source and to work listings, right? And to work, the reason I went this route versus open houses is because it, it, you can treat it like a nine to five. And that yeah. was the biggest piece for me, um, having control over my schedule versus reacting all day long. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's go to number two. So number two is referral partners. So uh, this is a little bit different than what we're talking about with networking. What I mean by referral partners is being strategic and you going out there and um, you building the relationship with another professional strategically because you want to align uh, from a business perspective, almost like a business partnership. So, so rather than just like the shotgun approach and just joining this networking group of 40 people and hoping and praying that they don't know a realtor, we're going to be a little bit more strategic. What do I mean? So we're going to go out there and start to build relationships with, uh, with financial planners. We're going to go out there and build relationships with divorce attorneys. We're going to go out there and build relationships with probate attorneys. These are professionals that are working with the consumer that most of the time has to buy or sell a house. So in other words, they have a need to have a business relationship with a trusted real estate advisor. And so that's the strategy is to go out there and to initiate relationships with these strategic business relation, uh, business partners so that long-term you've got this almost like board of advisors. That's the way I look at this, you guys, is unlike the networking where it's forced, this is you building your own team, right? So this is you going out there and strategically getting a builder on the team. This is you going out there and strategically getting a CPA on the team. This is you strategically getting the financial planner, the insurance agent, the, the uh, I mean, all local business owners can be part of your network or part of your team. So much so that this, you could treat this as a board of advisor. People, when I really did this at the highest level, I mean, we were all on each other's website. We met monthly in person and we're talking about, hey, what's working in your business? What's working in your business? We were at each other's Christmas events. We were at all of our client appreciation events. And it was like a one-stop shop. When you came into my world, and this is still what happens today, I've got your CPA, I've got your builder, I've got your painter, I've got your electrician, I've got everybody for you. I've got my team of people. And this is the same list that I use to provide value to my entire database, all of my past clients, all of my centers of influence. To me, I want to become the agent that people go to for everything. You need your sprinklers blown out before winter, you come to Brandon. You have to get your furnace looked at, you come to Brandon. And I am the source, I'm the nucleus. I'm the team captain of my team and I'm helping my partners win in a big level big way so that the law of reciprocity can come back to me so that you start getting emails from divorce attorneys saying, Hey, I've got one for you. A uh, couple's divorcing. Here's the property. You just go over there and get the contract signed. I want to get your guys' thoughts on, on this strategy as well. Dominic, let's start with you. Yep. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, some of the things that you mentioned, the longer you're in the business, the more often these happen. And you know that if somebody's calling you in October to say, Hey man, I need somebody to blow out our sprinklers that Probably the next time they need to do some sort of real estate transaction, you're also going to be top of mind. Same thing with uh, lawyers. You mentioned divorce lawyers, but probate attorneys. Uh, when somebody has a situation that happens, sometimes these things come up suddenly. If you're the known guy, the go-to guy for all of these great referrals that aren't real estate related directly, when a real estate transaction comes up, hey, you're going to be top of mind. And yeah, nourishing those relationships uh, has been one of the most benef beneficial things that we've done in our business. Like it, it is a fabulous layer that you should be adding to your business if you're not. Yeah, for sure. Ben, I know you've got a lot of experience with this, with this too, because of your past, you know, your career and, and your past life. I mean, this is, this is, I feel like one of your superpowers, like when I think about Ben, like this is how you go about business is business to business relationships rather than a business to consumer uh, approach. But yeah, give me your thoughts. Um, I, I love to use this and, and I'd love to hear your experience about how you guys got into this, but um, I like to just go where I like to go, right? The, the golf club, church, 
you know, school, right? And the people that I bump into that I like that are turn into quick relationships and I find out that they're in insurance, right? That's that's kind of been the foundation that this has worked really well for me. Um, because versus forcing these referral partners, when it happens that way, it's like, oh, I'm gonna call Kevin. Oh, he picks up my call every time, right? Because we've got so many things in common, right? Oh, Brandon goes to school with with my kids, right? Something like that. Um, the business stuff happens secondary, but then you can add so much value to each other. And then you connect, what happens is you connect your um, networks. So it's like, hey, Brandon, you know, who are you using for X, Y, Z? And when they make that introduction, it's just instant credibility for both of us and for that person knowing I'm going to, you know, do what I say I'm going to do because I'm coming from, you know, a referral from Brandon, et cetera. So, I mean, it's, I think, one of the most powerful ways to do any sort of business, um, but it, it's got to happen organically. It's got to come from a place of value and just true relationship in in my opinion yeah you just reminded me of something which is the foundation to make this strategy work the whole entire uh way in which this works is based on the client experience you see this is what i mean by this so i'm thinking about steve who you guys know who's my mortgage partner when i refer a client to steve i know that they are in phenomenal hands and me making that introdu in an introduction is the best thing for the client that to me is what referral partners are all about. It's about taking care of your clients first and foremost. It's not about uh, tit for tat, like, okay, you give me one, I give you one, you give me one. No, 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 this is about the client, right? And so in order to like service your clients the best possible way, it only makes sense that you have this group of trusted advisors around you. That's why I refer my CPA to everybody. I know what he's done for me. I refer them to both of you, you know? And that's the way I think that it works the best. It's about these professionals taking care of clients at the highest level, which then you got to make sure that when you get the opportunity to service someone's client, that you repay the favor. The favor being giving their client the absolute best experience of all time. So they go back to the person and say, wow, I'm so happy you referred me to Ben. That guy is a top-notch professional, which makes... The referral partners say, wow, I'm so glad I'm in business with Ben. Ben's my guy. I've solidified Ben's my guy. Because the first time, and it only takes once, that you get a referral from somebody and you shit the bed and you don't call them back and you don't return their call or you, don't, you, you, you just give them a bad experience, the relationship is probably over, actually. Not just you're not going to get any more business from them, but they're just like, oh, this guy's a flake. So you got to be a top-notch business professional to make this strategy work. All right, let's go to number one. Number one for every agent, for myself included, uh, is sphere of influence, past clients. And everybody knows this, but it's still the most neglected area of the business. You know, no one's surprised when I said that. But again, it's just an area of business I think is very, um, what's the word? Neglected for sure, but it's like... Uh, it's a, how do I go about this? Because I don't want to be the annoying realtor. I think that Ben mentioned earlier on in this episode where you're just like, you come around and everybody scatters. Oh, geez, here comes Ben again. He's going to talk about real estate. That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about, I've heard some just cringy, cringy scripts, like calling your best friend, Dominic, and you call Dominic, hey, Dominic, this is a business call. Like, give me a break. You know what I mean? Like, you're just not going to call your friend, Dominic, and say, this is a business call and say, who do you know that's looking to buy, sell, or invest in real estate? I know it's so cringy. I see you guys, it's so cringy. And I think a lot of agents, myself included, like that's what's being taught. So I just neglected this area of business for so long until I really understood uh, what it is. And to me, it, it it's a great piggyback off strategy number two, which is to serve, 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 serve. Just be a resource. Just be a resource. Let me give you an example, okay? We're not going to get into our entire top 100 strategy on this podcast, but let me just give the audience something to consider. 
One of the things, and we kind of mentioned it already, that I love doing that I've had great success with is I will go to our, uh, I'll go to our landscaper. Okay, this is a great example right now. Because it's starting to snow here in Metro Detroit, we will, we will pay for 10 driveways to get plowed. And we'll give that referral to our landscaping company who plows in the, in the, in the winter and then they cut the grass in the, in, the, in the summer. And we'll post it on social media. We'll email it out to the database, right? I'll send a video out and say, first 10 to respond to this, we'll get 10 pushes for free, right? To 10 different people push for free. Like most people don't have their snow removal companies in line. Like we just got a big dumping of snow the other day and people are scrambling, right? To get it shoveled off and get it cleaned up. And so this is what I'm talking about. Things like this is how in which you serve your past clients and your centers of influence. Because like Dominic said, when you approach it from this manner, you just burn yourself into their, their, their top of mind awareness that you're the real estate guy. You're the real estate girl. You're all things housing and you're just becoming memorable. I just gave one example. We've got a whole strategy around this, but Ben, let me go to you first on this uh, and, and how you think about this group of people. Yeah, you, you got to just, once again, add so much value, deepen the relationship, um, and, and just never ask for anything. You want this to just be so organic that it's just like, of course, we're going to call Brandon. Of course, we're going to call Dominic. Like, he's he knows so much. He's always sharing so many different things that are not direct hey do you want to sell that all connect back that it's just a no-brainer um and you just want to be so careful with this group of people because they are your friends they are your family um but it, it's just like anything it's like why why wouldn't we use dominic like this is just an absolute no-brainer all you're doing is just sharing your expertise when appropriate um and just being being a help yeah the way i look at this really quick too this 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 took a while it, it didn't hit me until i had kids and understanding this and when i say it the audience is gonna say yeah yeah i heard that before but becoming the social mayor mm. so to me i mean i coach my kids i manage their soccer teams and it wasn't like i was strategically saying all right i'm gonna be the soccer manager just try to get some listings it was a byproduct to ben's point I served these families for so long that when they were looking to sell their house, it's like, of course, we're going to use Brandon. You know how many real, you know how many conversations I had in the soccer field about the real estate market? It must have been three or five every game, three or five every game. Same thing right now. I'm coaching basketball. Hey, how's the real estate market? Every single time I see a parent, that's what they ask me, right? So of course, when they go to buy or sell a house, they're going to call Coach B. You know what I mean? It just makes sense. We do parties at our house. We do events for the kids. We do kickball tournaments in the summer for the neighborhood. Of course, we're going to call Brandon. So it's not like it's just about a giving mentality and you have to come from this space of, of caring and just giving. Not I'm not doing it so I can get something out of it. It's I'm going to just become the social uh, community mayor and everybody's going to know my name. And so I'm just going to be in that top of mind for everybody. And I just want the opportunity to serve people. Dominic, what's your experience like this? Well, it's, my experience has been positive and it's backed up by a Harvard study, I think about 10 years ago now, that uh, discovered that as the world gets bigger and advertising gets more and more and more direct, oddly enough, more business as we go forward is initiated as the result of a personal relationship than ever before in history. Great point. It's so it's so true. Like we're all going into our networks first and foremost to get that personal introduction. And if you're doing some of the things we're talking about, you can you can have this top of mind awareness that people trust. You're looking to become the trusted advisor. It's probably a better word than the social mayor. It's a trusted advisor because you're always serving the community and doing some of the things that we talked about. So I know we went pretty long, uh, but we just outlined. 10 ways to get clients. They all can work if you do the work, right? And so if you guys have questions as a result of this conversation, throw them in the comments. And just as a reminder, if you haven't done so already, feel free to download our brand new script book. I'll put a link in the description and uh, we'll see you guys on the next show.